So welcome everyone. I'm glad to see you, Anne. I missed you yesterday. Likewise. Yeah. And you are fine? I'm okay. You're okay. Good. And the babies are good. The babies are good. So that's that's very good. There's three people sitting uh, where Anne is. <laughs> Two of them are invisible. No, not really. <laughs> they are a bit visible. Yeah, so yesterday uh, we talked about uh, the possibility and the beauty of creating sacred spaces uh, in, in our life. And I would like to uh, start there, kind of a continuation of that, so that. Um, you, so sacred spaces, of course, one can uh, explore what that means in you no know, in the outside, you no know, going to sacred spaces or surrounding ourselves like George uh, with uh, images. Uh, so that's that's very precious. But also uh, realizing that a place becomes sacred through our presence. Yeah. So um, through how we perceive ourselves and the surroundings. And uh, after our teaching yesterday, after the teaching, I remember two stories from the Lam Rim. Uh, one is. Uh, <clears throat> There is this little Buddha statue on the on 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 the wayside, and uh, someone walks past this Buddha statue, and it is raining. And uh, he wants to protect the, this Buddha statue from the rain, so he puts one of his shoes like as a roof over the Buddha statue, and. Uh, so that was his expression of devotion. So it became an offering of putting this shoe on top of the head of the Buddha. And that is a joyful moment to connect with that devotional sacredness. And then uh, he, he walks further on and then another person comes and he looks at this and thinks, that's terrible. Someone put this dirty shoe on the Buddha. I take it away. Yeah. So he takes it away. And for him, that gesture is an expression of his devotion. And so both of them uh, relate to the symbol of the Buddha as a symbol of their own sacredness. And they have different ways to express their devotion. And the other story is, uh, it's a bit longer, so I, I, I'm, I can't tell the whole story, but it's about this uh, woman uh, who's very devotional in Tibet, and her son goes to a pilgrimage to Lhasa, and he tells her son to bring, up, bring back uh, a tooth of the Buddha. And so he does his pilgrimage, and when he comes back after a few months on the way home, just before he reaches home, he remembers, oh, I, um, I forgot to, uh, to bring her a tooth of the Buddha. So he sees uh, uh, the corpse of, the, of a dog on the wayside and he breaks out the tooth of the dog and wraps it into a kata. And uh, then he gives this uh, her mother and says, so here, I brought you a, a tooth of the Buddha. And uh, yeah, and she puts it on the altar and makes offerings, and uh, and so and then then this uh, this tooth starts to produce relics, yeah. So as a as a result of her devotion, and it becomes a very powerful object just through the power of her mind. So things are empty of being sacred or not sacred. It's uh, it's. It's, it's our mind, which has, has the capacity to 
turn this moment and wherever you are into a sacred space. And maybe we can all together kind of uh, make this shift into this Mahayana temple here where we are protected by Sol and the Dalai Lama and Lama Sopa Rinpoche and the Buddha and Tara and you know, we can all squeeze into George's room <laughs> because we are very small now. Right now we are very small, so we all fit in there, yeah. So uh, that's what what happens in in a lot of the Prajnaparamita sutras um, that uh, they have these gather gatherings of bodhisattvas. Uh, in um, from different universes in in one little room, yeah. So maybe they had already something like Zoom, yeah, or like that's how close we get in our material world, you know, being able to squeeze uh, many many people in a Zoom meeting into one place. So the we are in first uh, thirty three, I think. And uh, <clears throat> there's something there I want to bring into our first meditation also. Uh, so yesterday, uh, the topic was um, exploring how the critical mind is the void of joy, is the void of love. So how we undermine our capacity for joy and love and feeling connected to the critical mind in both directions, self-critical and critical of others. Um, and uh, verse 33 is um, about uh, exploration. It's the exploration of what is really important in our life. So it's an invitation to explore the possibility to relax um, the importance around some of the things which in the end don't really matter in our life. Although we might spend a lot of time and energy and emotional engagement, but in the long run, they don't matter really. So this is of course a very profound contemplation and um, so just the, this question, what is really important? And do I, do I have the inspiration to shift my priorities? In a sacred space where you actually create time in that sacred space to meet yourself, to meet your inner life, to connect with the goodness in you uh, might help us to become more aware how much our, our daily life is an engagement with things which are not really important to us. And one of the contemplations, and uh, Ken McLeod brings that up in his commentary, one of the contemplation in the Lam Rim, which helps us to shift our priority is the contemplation on, on death, um, remembering death. Yeah. Knowing that we are going to die soon, some of us a bit longer, some, some of us quite soon, we don't know. Um, is a contemplation which brings us into the present moment, into the preciousness of aliveness. And it also helps us to do this more and more often throughout our activities in daily life, more and more often to, to gravitate to, uh, to present moment awareness and the possibility of, to connect with our inner beauty, 
which we can only connect with in the present moment. And it's always available. So we start to understand, we start to experience that the sense of security or the sense of contentment or meaning, which we might seek in approval from others and material success, that that is not really what is nurturing our deepest longing. So in our meditation now, you know, after arriving and so on, I would like to uh, pick uh, the reflection of Ken McCloyd. And uh, he suggests, he just, just, just asked just for a few minutes, and I thought maybe like five minutes, um, to contemplate the question, if this would be the last five minutes of my life. So we imagine this is the last five minutes of my life. And then to just see where your mind goes. How do you want to live the last five minutes of your life? So meaning you can't fulfill your projects. Let's also say you don't have your mobile, mobile phone around, so you can't call anyone. Um, there, so there's nothing, nothing you can do. You can't, it's, it, this is it. Yeah? So, so where, where does your mind go? So, and that might help us, that's his idea. Um, that might, might help us to appreciate that which is really important. Yeah. So this is not meant to scare us or make us feel guilty or go into, um, oh, I should have done this and I shouldn't have done that. There's no time for that. Uh, yeah. So there's no time to uh, kind of uh, finish or everything and uh, so on. Um, so just five minutes of really just letting go of the attachment and exaggerated engagement with projects in our life, which will never bring us home. And not only that, that attachment and that engagement with all these projects might be so time intensive and emotional so intensive that there is little time in our life to turn to the source of deep contentment, of deep meaning, of deep joy. So it is a bit of a reminder. I mean, it's not for us, it is not an, uh, a question you know, to go to the cave and leave everything behind, but it is a reminder that it is possible to stay engaged in our relationship, in our work, but with less seriousness, with less engagement, with less hope that this project will bring us home. And it might be, uh, in, it might trigger an inspiration uh, for making uh, little sacred pauses throughout the day where you turn to the source. And that can be done in your office. Yeah? It's, I mean, your, your Buddha nature is never far away. It's not like you need to travel a long time. It's, it's just a, like a, a, little, a little shift, a little shift of going inside into the body, gravitating towards present moment awareness. So let's take our seats. And again, 
um, I said that also yesterday, you know, just taking the seed is already a mudra, it's a symbol, yeah? And if you have done this again and again, then uh, your body remembers. And when you take this seat in the way it's comfortable for you, you might already start to experience a bit of a shift. Yeah? So you take the seat with gentleness, but also with this dignity and with this confidence. And it is always very beautiful and inspiring to uh, go into this posture uh, together with others as a group, as a Sangha. Yeah, and then at one point, maybe your eyes want to close. And of course, you can also sit with open eyes and then your gaze relaxes. Take a few moments to adjust your posture. And, and then there's a sense that the doors of the temple open. And, and you step in, you slide in into the sacred space of our meeting. And that's where you settle. So you shift from the head into the body, from living thought-based and story-based, you gravitate towards present moment awareness. The past it exists only in thoughts, the future exists only in thoughts. This is what you have. This is life unfolding within your awareness. And then the breath as an ally. In breath dropping into the trunk of your body, sliding, and out breath, like a sighting, like letting go, softening, in the belly and in the shoulders, in your face, And checking in, the inner weather. The conditioned level of your mind, the uh, stories, mental images, they become less important. And uh, ordinary appearances of your body and your surroundings starts, start to become more transparent. Also, knowing that whatever you experience is an experience within consciousness, within mind, and that the solidness of the floor, the walls around you, and the ceiling is a projection.
What, what do you bring with you into this moment? Who is here? The, the many possibilities, the many parts of you. Who is here? And let's together extend a welcoming to all the processes, all the sensations, all the feelings, the emotions. So this is such a beautiful opportunity in our meditation to turn towards our inner life with loving kindness, with curiosity, with appreciation. So you do less and less and you settle more and more. And when you notice that you get caught and thoughts about the future, thoughts about the past or commentary to the present, then that's not a problem. That's what happens. That's what our mind does, what the narrative self does. But the invitation is then to slide back into your hands, into your belly, into pleasant or unpleasant areas. And then we are open to the energy or the presence of sacred spaces. So for some, that could be the memory of being in a place like that or If you can open to the experience that you're surrounded and pervaded. By a light or Essence love. It's a vast, boundless, energetic stillness. Sweet. But also unspeakable, ungraspable, undescribable. And for some people, uh, the easiest way to connect with this undescribable, ungraspable spaciousness is to call upon the Holiness the Dalai Lama or Lama Sopa Rinpoche, the Buddha, other masters, teachers, mentors, Buddhist or non-Buddhist. So we can invoke these images, these symbols, and 
but we want to slide into a non-symbolic experience of what they represent. And then you marinate in that, you bathe in that. Maybe there's sound. There could be also the scent of sacredness. And then you rest. Or resting happens. Because the more and more you relax, less and less there's an eye there. Uh, less and less there is an eye there which is meditating. So it becomes effortless meditation, just sitting. And allow everything which unfolds within your within you and outside you, around you. Uh, just let that unfold in that space, in that spacious awareness. Gravitate to uh, thought free space as if you are, you know, if, as if you are in a shoreless ocean and <clears throat> you start by being caught up in the waves and then slowly you sink into the depth. So the waves they continue to come and go. But you experience more and more peacefulness or stillness. There's nothing you need to understand. There's nothing you need to do right now. This is B. Just be. Forget. Forget who you are. On the narrative self level. Be the, be, be the awareness, be the space. You, we, we can't know how to be space or how to be awareness or what awareness is, but Maybe this little invitation, be awareness, be space. Maybe you can experience a little shift. Be awareness. or be presence. Good. 
e estamos. And, uh, this stillness, this presence, this awareness is pervading everything, your inner and your outer life. <clears throat> and you stay, you can stay connected, of course, with some of the symbols of sacredness. If that helps you, that feels good. Or you can see what happens if you really let go of everything you know. including spiritual teachings. Be awareness, be presence, be space, and be the sky, a heart like the sky. So these words that don't doesn't mean that you need to do something. It's pointing to something which is already the case. It's opening to something. Something you can't know. But your heart knows already. Your whole body. And then I want to invite the awareness of death and I would like to just sit quietly with you for the last five minutes of your life. So you stay in your body, connecting with the breath, the present moment awareness. This is the last five minutes of your life.
where does your heart go, your mind? What has happened? Just being curious about that, just observing, just noticing. While the clock ticks. So with each in-breath, with each out-breath, you come closer to death.
So one minute is left. The clock is ticking. The last minute of the slide. So in the death process, <clears throat> the death process is a dissolution of everything you think you are. So letting go of your roles, of your memories, of your relationships. Of your worries. Of all projects. But also letting go of this body. which we are very much identified with, also the body. And that is uh, dissolving into the unknown. a timeless, boundaryless unknown. Centerless. Jesus says that <clears throat> this unknown is in the nature of love. From the unknown, from the unknown, which is in the nature of love, the intention arises to help.
to serve, to heal, to contribute. To share the experience of the unknown with others. And this intention is called Bodhicitta. And from the experience of the unknown, carried by the power of bodhicitta, you manifest in this body. So you become aware of your body. Your legs, your the trunk of your body, the arms. Your head, your hands. And you become aware of your habits and personality. And in a way, it's the same, but it's also very different because you experience this body and this personality is an opportunity to be of benefit, to make a difference. When you feel that wish that has aspiration coming from the sacred space in your heart, radiating out through your hands, through your mouth, through your eyes, through your whole body, into your surroundings. You don't need to do anything. This being, this being from the power of bodhicitta. Just trusting the aspiration, just trusting the intention of bodhicitta. So in any in-breath is an expression of bodhicitta taking care of yourself. And <clears throat> every out-breath is an expression of bodhicitta contributing, sharing. So may we all take good care of ourselves. May we all take good care of others. Also the animals. And may we all take good care of the earth.
Yes, and then if you have your eyes closed, you take your time. Reconnect with your surroundings. The preciousness of seeing, right? <clears throat> uh, probably, uh, <clears throat> if we would have the last minutes of our life now, one thing which probably we all would want to do is to look, yeah, to see. Uh, because it's just just such a amazing amazing capacity we have to see colors and shapes and everything can be so beautiful ordinary things can be so unique and beautiful and because everything around you every single item including the clothes you wear is there's some some mystery in that some it's a reflection of the divine. So really looking at things, you know, and enjoying you know, the, the capacity to kind of zoom in and in some into some things, and then zoom out, taking the whole thing, and then colors and shapes. Wow, well, and then you know we can we can see parts of your body also. Yeah. And then you can look at the screen and and look uh, and, and look at angels. Another thing we probably would want to do in our last minutes is to really breathe. Because uh, breathing is, I mean, wow. It's like in your last minutes, you don't want to miss one breath. It's so, wow, it's like, it's like drinking nectar breath. And it's also uh, it's a, the experience of being connected with every everything and everyone. So you breathe in the earth, the earth, the, the 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 air of the earth, and you make your contribution with your out breath. Yeah, so is there any, any comment you would like to make? How did, how did it go, the last five minutes of your life? Was there some surprises for you or was it difficult? Maybe someone would like to share something. Or maybe you have a question. Yeah, Pat, you need to unmute yourself. So I was just reading this morning. Um, it was an article by Pema Chodron and she was quoting Ken McCloyd mm. about um, the Bardo and the sort of question of her article was, um, 
think it was who goes into the bardo. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and of course, his answer is no one, you know, mm -hmm. no one goes into the bardo. So, um, yeah, so I just wanted to say that. And I guess my experience was, uh, I don't know, I felt very relaxed and kind of happy. Mm. Was also, <laughs> so I think I was also, to the degree that I was thinking, I sort of thought, <laughs> give me no one. I'm gonna, I'm just gonna float into the bardo. Mm. And I was a little shocked when we came back into our bodies and you said <laughs> that we were now full of the intention to help and bodhicitta. And I thought, oh, mm. my God. Yeah, no, not. <laughs> mm. I'm really not there yet. Uh, mm. But I was just, you know, I was just going to kind of float on the, you know, on the waves of dying into the bardo and. Mm -hmm. but not unhappily but just not you know maybe not full of you know not full of bodhicitta but um but full of you know light lightness i yeah <laughs> no question just you know. yes thank you mm. yeah That is uh, for me uh, also uh, uh, an interesting exploration um, how to, uh, first, what bodhicitta is, uh, but also <clears throat> how to connect uh, with. Uh, With a with a natural, uh, I think something we probably can all find in us with a natural intention to to not harm others and and, and to benefit others whenever it's possible, but without making that a burden. Yeah, without uh, falling into. Uh, yeah, I can't do anything or what could I do and actually I'm so tired in my life or so busy uh, yeah so I think that's a that's <clears throat> that's why I <clears throat> said when I did that meditation I mean I never planned things like that but it just hap it, it just happens but what happened was that I said something like and you don't need to do anything your being, yeah? So to trusting your being and, and um, and, and letting, and then allowing words or activities or steps to arise from that relaxed kind of being. And trusting that without 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 stress, without pressure, without um, yeah. Yes, thank you. Oh, and yes. and I think yeah, I was very much in a space without language, so. Mm. Maybe it was just the language, you know, the language. Yeah. Yes. Any intervention of language would right. be a, dis mm. a disruption somehow. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hi. Um, hi, Stefan. Hi. My name is Tom. I'm new to the group, but uh, yes, I, I have listened to quite a lot of your talks, so thank you for that. Um, I just wanted to also share my experience, not really a mm -hmm. question. Um, when 
when you said like we're sinking down into the ocean uh at first i was um got a bit panicky and uh mm -hmm. couldn't breathe and right. um, but then that kind of opened up and it was like i became just the whole ocean and then just space um mm. and it sounds a bit corny but uh mm. it was it was like everything and everyone that i know and every animal and um it was just operating within within me as that space yes um mm. and yeah and, and there was all this suffering uh but it was also being absorbed uh by by the openness and mm. it felt extraordinarily peaceful yes um, mm -hmm. and yeah so i just wanted to mm. thank you for that i've i've never i haven't really i mean i've had a few near-death experiences but um they have mostly been you know uh through panic and uh mm. And then a bit of opening up, but but it was interesting exercise to do that, and uh, I'll be doing that again. Uh, so thank you yeah. for that, um, and thank you for the sacred space. Yes, thank you, Tom. Uh, I, it doesn't sound corny, <laughs> what you say. Uh, <laughs> also, the way you said it, there was no like uh, you know, there was not a big eye there uh, sharing that experience. Um, and uh, I think that's uh, mm, it's something uh, which I don't say often because uh, it's it's I can't explain it. Uh, I can't uh, or I can't uh, or I don't want to convince anyone um mm. of this uh, but my deepest experience of this is everything is just fine as it is yeah yeah so but it's it's almost embarrassing to say it, of course, why it's like, it, it, yeah, then I could say that it's, it, it sounds corny or so. But <laughs> this has been actually my experience where I can kind of, kind of step back into, well, open to that experience, you know, and, and, and you described it. Yeah? So th what you described is actually something uh, which resonated very deeply with my own experience. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, I think it's it's probably corny to think it and say it, but um, yeah. <laughs> yes. uh, feeling it's a, it's a different story. Yeah, yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah thank you. Yes. Yes, so let's see if something comes up with the uh, with the first uh, first thirty three. When you squabble with others about status and rewards, and you squabble with others about status and rewards. Or just appreciating where that is part of your life you know, in your work or
competition with others. You undermine learning, reflection, and meditation. So that's you know, pointing to this um, exaggerated engagement with things which are in the end don't matter, but which take so much time and so much energy that it, it keeps us on the surface when we use this metaphor of the ocean again, it, it keeps us on the surface of our reactive mind. So I, like the, the, mental, the mental energy uh, you know, of fear and hope, and what do other people think of me? wanting to be successful, wanting to give a good impression. So then he, he, he says something, I don't know, we probably need to rephrase or something. He says, let go of any investment in your family circle. Yeah? Let go of any investment in, this, in, in, in your family circle. What do you think about that? Uh, so what I, uh, what I said uh, at one point, uh, I think, today was uh, to explore the possibility to stay engaged without attachment. So I, I wouldn't read this as a, no, so if I would be like a, a monk, yeah? So definitely when, when in, in the years when I was a monk, I kind of tried to go down that road, but it's actually not a healthy road. Yeah, uh, so um, I think, so I think it's more an exploration. How can we stay engaged with other people and also without our job, uh, with, with into our job and, and, and our livelihood uh, with less seriousness, with less hope and fear. So maybe that it would be, letting go of the investment, yeah? Like this exaggerated grasping. Um, so how, how much mental energy, and Ken McCloyd gives us some, some examples, how much, how much mental e energy and activity do we put into um, wanting to be seen in a certain way by our parents or uh, by our brothers and sisters and um, the competition between siblings. Um, so whenever I see a radical statements like this, let, let go of any, um, whatever, then, um, then I, I kind of rather think relax, you know, relax the investment. So that's for me much more uh, realistic and, and uh, inspiring also, because uh, you know, if, if someone would, uh, I mean, it would make me unhappy to think of that my, my Buddhist practice would would mean to let go of any investment in, into my friends. And because like friendship, for example, is one of the most precious things in my life. It's something to live for. And if you want to have relationships to people, you need to cultivate them. You need to put some energy into it. You need to spend time with them. And, 
and uh, um, yeah, so that's just <clears throat> some reflection on this, uh, how I uh, how I kind of uh, translate instructions like this for me, changing the words maybe. Um, and sometimes it is a, a, a Buddhist ped pedagogical tool to kind of exaggerate, uh, like as a as a remedy for an exaggerated attachment to friends and family, to say kind of the opposite. Yeah, to just let go of it. Yeah, uh, it, but but. Uh, then we are asked, I guess, to find a middle way there and and, you know, and a healthy way to, to live instructions like that. So let go of any investment in your family circle and or the circle of those who support you. Yeah, again, uh, for me, that that is um, uh, relaxing that. Um, attachment the the very the various for me for example is about uh, uh you know the groups who support me and you know people who support my livelihood um but i don't want to let go of investment into these relationships because there's a way to relate to the same people, your family, and also the people who support you, which is beneficial for both sides. Yeah. Steph, yes, so, excuse me, yeah. we, there were three quests, three hands have been raised recently. Ah, okay. So Lona, Mikkel, and um, okay, yeah, yeah, sure. I didn't, I didn't see that. No, I know. I yeah, I, I can't see it. They're so, all very polite so, and hesitant. Yeah, yeah. Maybe <laughs> only the administrator sees that. So yeah. Lona and, and Mikkel and and Ali, that was the order. Yeah, very good. Yeah. So, would you like me to start? Sorry, my camera. Yes. Okay. Uh, uh, yeah, so it was just in, in relation to what we experienced and exactly as you say now, to relax a bit. And so mm -hmm. I felt that, yeah, relief <laughs> and puzzle that it's actually, it is gonna solve itself. Mm -hmm. And even though I don't take control or I don't lead the relations, they might just, it might, all figure itself out and yeah. that feeling of less separation between us yeah uh, so it's just a very strong exercise the the reflecting on death or yes yeah, yeah. yes yeah. yeah and all this the things that we try to i try to control and make sense of and make sure mm. that will go in the right way. Mm. Huh. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And how beautiful it is. Yeah. Uh, so if, if we enjoy it enough, if I do. <laughs> mm. Mm. So it was only that. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, it's, it's, I mean, it's, you know, when we tap into this experience that everything is just fine as it is and that we don't need to solve everything. And that, so that, that's, that's amazing, amazing way to be.
Yeah, and then who else? Hi, Stefan, it's Mikko. I think I was. Yeah, hi, Mikko. Hi, thank you so much. I really, really enjoyed that meditation. It had an, uh, mm -hmm. had an acuteness to it that was, uh, it was really profound to me. Um, it felt like I had this rush of gentle uh, bodhicitta, uh, mm -hmm. like acute bodhicitta <laughs> wanting to express itself, you know, um, mm -hmm. you know, just wanting to stay in, in sort of equipoise of forgiveness, love, gratitude, bliss, and very independent of forms and shape because knowing that in a second it will all be dissolved mm. and i see that actually feeds into your question about the letting go of um, the investment in your family circle which has mm. a very profound meaning to me because i as i've mm. shared with you before i don't see a lot of my family i've kind of have had to take that choice yeah. uh, but there has been a very very profound learning for me in that which is that I have learned to get to know parts of myself that has kept on longing for a certain so sort of affection or being sorted or being fixed by my family yeah. that I look into the eyes which has been very very liberating yes. to sort of say I have to let go of that yearning to be fixed by something that created me you know? mm. um mm. The way that has been generalized to what text also talks about in other forms of support system. I do enjoy my support systems, but I think, you know, what came to mind just before I opened the camera was, um, the mic here was that I just remember, you know, we all know that Buddha left his family, you know, why did he do that? I think mm -hmm. the what it speaks to here as well is that there is this, mm -hmm. as much as we need love and support on our journey, at the final steps of the journey, maybe we will have to relinquish all those ties and be able to find that sourcing, that Buddhahood inside ourselves, completely yeah. independent of all forms of shape, because they will all vanish again and again and again. Yes. Keep that attachment to them, we'll be in some sorrow forever. But the biggest sacrifice is to say, you know, mm. they, in, in essence, they don't exist. In essence, there's only one relationship there's the relationship with me and the universe. Mm. Mm before all the other ones mm. um, jesus said the same thing you know if you want to come to me you have to leave your sister and your brother and your family mm. and walk mm. away from i know yeah. that makes sense, but that's that's what it makes, makes sense yeah it's very good thank you yeah it's great to <clears throat> reflect on uh verses like this with different kind, different people, you know, so it becomes richer and richer, yeah, yeah, mm. yes. Mm. I mean, to, obviously, to be honest, I can say it's a very, it's a very tough road, you know, it's a road that entails a lot of grief, yeah well, me anyway because you know all mm. those immature parts of yourself come up they have for me anyway in in finding those hopes that will never be qualified you know mm. and then saying okay what else is there is there a ground i can rely on that is independent yeah. that means i have to find yeah. that myself. It is. yeah yeah it's really beautiful what you say yeah I, I, I'm reminded of, um, I, maybe I shared this here also, when my mother passed away in March, I met this part which wanted to uh, be loved by my mother and hear again what a wonderful I am. And uh, yeah, so, and, um, so now I can read this sentence also, um, you know, letting go of the investment is like this, you know, it is uh, letting go of that hope that someone else can fill the cup in, in my heart, yeah? Uh, <laughs> um, and also, um, I really connect with what you said at the end is, is there something else? Yeah. And that's, of course, what all mystical traditions say. Yes, there is something. There is a ground 
or an, a non-ground which we can stand on or dissolve into. Or, um, yes. Yes. Um, so actually, the the comment that I was going to make is kind of an echo, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, or yeah. right in line with what what Mikhail was saying. That um, for me, verse thirty three was really about you know, the letting go is about how we choose to define our self, um, mm -hmm. and choosing to do that as a more inward process than based on the outer, the outer yeah. relationships. Yes. Uh, yeah. How to do, yeah, how to define ourselves as an inward process. Yeah. That's right. That's letting go of the investment. Mm. Yes. Thank you. I see another hand, 1917, I don't have a name. I don't know if you see that hand or if 1917. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I see that hand, right. Was there anything on the chat or was it just you posting? Just information, right? Uh, oh, can you? But there oh, were sorry. Oh, oh, hello. Can you yeah, hear hi. Me? Hi. Hi. Sorry about that. This is Jennifer, 1917. Uh, uh, okay. Jennifer. Hi. Um, hi. Yeah, it's actually, hi. I've been on the um, train during this meditation uh, oh, okay. because I'm headed to a good friend's 70th birthday party. So um, okay. at first I was very, you know, not happy that I'd be on the train, but it worked out perfectly. Yes. Because um, the sacred space became the train, and yeah. the train became the metaphor for journeying. Mm -hmm. And um, I was actually surprised at how easy it was to to let go, um, mm -hmm. because death has always been something of a bit of a trepidation. Um, mm -hmm. But I realized that I think the one regret that I would have if I were to only have five minutes left of this mm -hmm. life would be to not, you know, explore that inner goodness more. Mm -hmm. And I was I was also amazed that, mm -hmm. you know, on one level, I think, you know, self-compassion can be so hard for me. But then during the meditation, it actually became really easy mm -hmm. because I could see, you know, how much, oh, you know, struggle and this and that and busyness, you know, there has been in my life. And all of a sudden, at that moment, I was like, oh, but that's not necessary. And it was just this beautiful experience. Um, and then it was lovely to um, dissolve um, out of, you know, this reality, but then jump back in. Because at the end, I was leaving the train. And this conductor, you know, he was like standing right next to me really closely. And both, I think there was just probably this openness, you know, that I had in my energy. And yes. then I said, thank you to him. And then we just looked into each other's eyes like human beings. And it was this beautiful moment. Mm -hmm. so it was really, it was really lovely to be able to step back on one hand and just let it go, but then also jump back in into reality yeah. and to experience that all, you know, on a, on a Metro North train <laughs> yeah. it was just special. <laughs> so, um, so thank you. I just wanted to share and also just thank you sincerely for that, for that experience and thank the group as well. Yes. Beautiful. Thank you, Jennifer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Let's take a few moments to just 
appreciate our experience today, the sacred space. It's also beautiful to think about that, you know, there's some people from Europe here and kind of creating this uh, connection, this bridge over the ocean. So it's a big sacred space. And just being And in a moment of openness, relaxing the sense of a separate eye, there is a sense of uh, connection with everything, with everyone, with all beings. And maybe for a moment, we can all confirm or trust the goodness, which is indestructibly pervading everything and everyone. So, as if all experiencing how all beings are waves in the ocean of love, uh, waves in the ocean of ultimate bodhicitta. Yeah, and may we, all of us, look after ourselves and maybe look after others. And may we look after the earth as an expression, as an effortless expression of our true nature. And maybe you want to reach out to some of the people you worry about, inviting them into the experience, into this sacred space, or extending this sacred space to them. Okay. Thank you so much. I almost said namaste now. <laughs> <laughs> but it's good. Yeah? So it's a good, a good thing to say, you know, namaste. Uh, I'm greeting the divine in you. Yeah? So it's a beautiful greeting. Uh, so, yeah, it's. There's one meeting left, and um, I mean for for this text. So we'll see. Uh, it's it's in the middle of December, but we already uh, 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 planned a new series. So uh, I will continue to be around <laughs> as long as I'm in this body, at least. <laughs> Okay, take care. Stefan. Thank you. Have a nice day. Namaste. Thank you, Thank you, Stefan. Everybody. Bye. Thank you.